His name is Abdul Yutzai ibn Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim. According to Islamic narrations and in line with Arabic history, Abu Lahab Arabic, Ab Libi c. 549 was Muhammad's paternal uncle. He is condemned in Surah al-Masid, for being an enemy to Islam. <laughs> Family He was born in Mecca c. 549, the son of Abdul Muttalib, chief of the Hashim clan, and of Lubna bint Hajar, who was from the Kuzas tribe. People from the Kuzas tribe were the caretakers of the Kaaba for several centuries, before the Quraysh took over the responsibility through their ancestor Qusai ibn Kilab. Abu Lahab was the half-uncle of Muhammad since Muhammad's grandmother was Fatima bint Amr of Banu Makhzam clan. His original name was Abd al-Uzza, but his father called him Abu Lahab. Father of flame, because of his beauty and charm, due to his red inflamed cheeks. He is described as an artful spruce fellow with two locks of hair, wearing an Aden cloak, and as very generous. He married Arwa Um Jamil bint Harb, sister of Abu Sufyan, Sakar, whose father Harb was chief of the Umayya clan. Their children included Utba, Utaba, Muatab, Dora, Fakita, Uzza, and Khalida. Abu Lahab had another son, also named Dora, who may have been born by another woman. He may also have been the father of Mazru, a son born to his slave Thuwaiba. His daughter Dora embraced Islam and became a narrator of Hadith. One is in Ahmad's Musnad, where she reports that a man got up and asked the Prophet, Who is the best of the people? He answered, The best of the people is the most learned, the most God-fearing, the most to be enjoining virtue, the most to be prohibiting vice and the most to be joining the kin. Utbah also embraced Islam after the conquest of Mecca and pledged allegiance to Muhammad. The Wasabaha c. 613 When Muhammad announced that he had been instructed by God to spread the message of Islam openly, the Quran told him to warn his kinsfolk about divine punishment. He therefore climbed Mount Safa and shouted, Wa Sabaha, which means, O calamity of the morning. In Arabia this alarm was traditionally raised by any person who noticed an enemy tribe advancing against his own tribe at dawn. On hearing this, the inhabitants of Mecca assembled at the mountain. Muhammad then addressed the clans by name, O Banu Hashim, O Banu Abd al-Matalib, and so on, if I were to tell you that behind this hill there is an enemy about to attack you, would you believe me? The people responded that they would, since Muhammad was known to be honest. He continued saying, then I warn you that you are heading for a torment. Quote, At this point, Abu Lahab interrupted, woe be on you the rest of the day. Is that what you summoned us for? Another tradition recalls Abu Lahab picking up a stone to throw at his nephew. Abu Lahab rejected the claims of Muhammad and said, Muhammad promises me things which I do not see. He alleges that they will happen after my death. What has he put in my hands after that? Then he blew on his hands and said, May you perish. I can see nothing in you of the things that Muhammad says. Topic the Surah of Abu Lahab as a direct result of this incident, a chapter of the Quran, Al Masad, the palm fiber, was revealed about him. Its English translation by Sahih International reads, In the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful, BSM al Alraman Alram perish the two hands of Abu Lahab, and perish he, his wealth will not avail him or that which he gained, he will enter to burn in a fire of blazing flame, his wife as well, the carrier of firewood, thorns of Satan which she used to put on the way of the Prophet. Around her neck is a rope of twisted fiber Masad, Um Jamil is called the bearer of the wood because she is said to have carried thorns and cast them in Muhammad's pathway. Being a next-door neighbor to Muhammad, she also threw garbage over the wall into Muhammad's house. Abu Lahab had married two of his sons to the daughters of Muhammad, Utba to Rukhaya and Utaiba to Um Kultham. However, the marriages were never consummated, presumably because the girls were so young. After the announcement of al-Masad, Abu Lahab told his sons, My head is unlawful to your head if you do not divorce Muhammad's daughters, they therefore divorced them. Abu Lahab's daughter Dora was at some stage married to Zayd ibn Haritha, who was at that time regarded as Muhammad's son, and they were later divorced, but the timing of this marriage and divorce is not known. Later, she married Harith ibn Nafil of Banu Hashim, and after his death, she married Diyah ibn Khalifa. 
Topic Other acts of opposition 613 When the Quraysh began to torture the Muslims, Abu Lahab's brother Abu Talib called upon the Hashim and al-Mutalib clans to stand with him in protecting his nephew. It was a custom among the Arabs to staunchly support their own clan. Despite the dissension between Muhammad and some members of Banu Hashim and Banu Mutalib, most of them stood by him in his predicaments and provided him protection and security except Abu Lahab. Once Abu Lahab asked Muhammad, If I were to accept your religion, what would I get? Muhammad replied, You would get what the other believers would get. Abu Lahab responded, Is there no preference or distinction for me? In which Muhammad replied, What else do you want? Abu Lahab replied back, May this religion perish in which I and all other people should be equal and alike. While Muhammad was praying near the Kaaba, Abu Lahab once threw the entrails of a sacrificed camel over him. Muhammad later told Aisha, I was between two bad neighbors, Abu Lahab and Uqba ibn Abu Mu'ayt. They brought excrements and threw them before my door and they brought offensive material and threw it before my door. Muhammad said he came out of his house, saying, O sons of Abdumanif, is it the behavior of a neighbor? And threw the rubbish away. He was overjoyed and expressed his sheer happiness at the news of the death of Abdullah, Muhammad's second son and celebrated it with Az ibn Wa'il, Abu Jal and other enemies of Islam. Besides, they also dubbed Muhammad al-Abtar. So Allah revealed Surah al qadir on the seventh year of preaching Islam, the Quraysh imposed boycott on Banu Hashim and Banu Mutalib and forced them to live in a mountain gorge outside the city. Most of the members of Banu Hashim had not accepted Islam at that time. Yet they stood by Muhammad and suffered as much as he did. Abu Lahab was the only member of Banu Hashim who supported the boycott and did not join his clan. Through a deep sense of animosity, Abu Lahab violated this Arab tradition and took the side of non-Muslim Quraysh clans. Abu Lahab renounced his affiliation with the Hashim clan and remained in Mecca. Soon afterwards, he met his sister-in-law, Hind bint Utbah, and said to her, Haven't I helped Al-Lat and al uzza and haven't I abandoned those who have abandoned them and assisted their opponents? She replied, Yes, and may God reward you well, O Abu Utba. Topic between the boycott and Badr After the boycott was lifted, another nephew, Abu Salama, came to Abu Talib asking for protection. When the Maqsam clan protested about this, Abu Lahab supported his brother. He told the Makamites, O Quraysh, you have continually attacked this sheikh for giving his protection among his own people. By God, you must either stop this or we will stand in with him until he gains his object. The Makamites wanted to keep Abu Lahab's support, and therefore they agreed not to annoy Abu Salama. Abu Talib died in 620. From this time, Muhammad went around the trade fairs and markets to tell the Arab tribes that he was a prophet and call them to worship Allah. Abu Lahab used to follow him around the fairs, saying, This fellow wishes only to get you to strip off Al-Lat and al uzza from your necks and your allies the jinn of the Malik ibn Yukish tribe for the misleading innovation he has brought. Don't obey him and take no notice of him, someone reported, Before my own Islam I used to see the Prophet in markets outside Makkah calling out, People, say there is no deity save Allah and you will prosper. People would gather around him but a man, bright-faced, intelligent looking, with two locks of hair hanging down, would appear from the rear and say, This man has renounced the religion of his forefathers. He is a liar, he followed the Prophet wherever he went. The people would inquire who he was to learn that it was his the prophet's uncle, once Abu Lahab chased and hit Muhammad with stones in one of those markets. He hit so hard that his feet began to bleed profusely and his slippers were filled with his own blood causing great pain and difficulty in walking. Muhammad and most of the Muslims left Mecca in 622, and Abu Lahab had no further direct interaction with his nephew. Topic death When the rest of the Quraysh went to Badr to protect the merchant caravan carrying their property from an expected attack, Abu Lahab remained in Mecca, sending in his place Abu Jal's brother Al as Ibn Hisham ibn al Mughira, who owed him 4,000 dirhams that he could not pay. So he hired him with them on the condition that he should be cleared off his debt. The first people to reach Mecca with the news of the Quraysh defeat in the Battle of Badr were Al Hazaman and Abdullah ibn al Khuzai, who bewailed the fact that so many of their chieftains had fallen on the battlefield. Abu Lahab went to the large tent of Zamzam, his face as black as thunder. Before long, his nephew Abu Sufyan ibn al Harith arrived, so he called him over for news. A small crowd gathered around the two as Abu Sufyan told his uncle, the facts are the Quraysh met our enemy and turned their backs. They the Muslims, put us to flight, taking prisoners as they pleased. 
I cannot blame our tribesmen because they faced not only them but men wearing white robes riding piebald horses, who were between heaven and earth. They spared nothing, and no one had a chance. At the other end of the tent, a Muslim freedman named Abu Rafi and Abbas's wife Lubaba sat sharpening arrows. When they heard the news of the men in white riding between heaven and earth, they could no longer contain their happiness, and Abu Rafi exclaimed, They were angels. Abu Lahab was so furious that he forced the frail Abu Rafi to the ground and beat him up. Lubaba grabbed a nearby tent pole and hit her brother in law over the head, crying, do you think that you can abuse him just because Abbas is away? Lubaba wounded Abu Lahab so severely that his head was split open, laying bare part of his skull. The wound turned septic, and his entire body erupted into open pustules. He died a week later. This would have been in late March 624. The smell from Abu Lahab's wound was so repulsive that nobody could come near him. His family left his decaying body decomposing in his home for two or three nights until a neighbor rebuked them. It is disgraceful. You should be ashamed of leaving your father to rot in his house and not bury him from the sight of men. They then sent in slaves to remove his body. It was watered from a distance, then pushed with poles into a grave outside Mecca, and stones were thrown over it. A Muslim narration says that after Abu Lahab's death, some of his relatives had a dream in which they saw him suffering in hell. He told them that he had experienced no comfort in the afterlife, but that his sufferings had been remitted. This much. Indicating the space between his thumb and index finger because of his one virtuous deed of manumitting his slave Thuwaiba, who had briefly suckled Muhammad. References <references> <references>